And so, yeah, so this morning uh, we have quite a number of new people. And um, basically, if today is your first time or last week, uh, what you may not be aware of is that we're in a series. Uh, and this is the series of the letter to uh, the Hebrews. It's been quite a roller coaster. It's been up and down, but man, it's been very, very healthy, very, very good, uh, good for my soul. And so as in the letter of Hebrews, you know, they, there's a couple of things that come up uh, that we'll be going through as we go through the letter. Uh, and one of them is the Jesus being superior, uh, Jesus being the superior uh, priest. And so this morning, our text, Hebrews 8, will basically take us through that. And so we'll deal with it in two parts. Part one, um, just basically putting together um, stamping that Jesus is superior to anything and everything. And then in part two, we'll deal with the new covenant that Christ's priesthood um, oversees. But before we do that, um, yeah, permit me to actually read, read the text and then I will pray for us. So as is custom, uh, the text will be, be, uh, will be behind us. You can follow on the screen. Or you can take out your device or your Bible and um, follow along. And so Hebrews 8, uh, this is the word of the Lord. Now, the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not by man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Uh, therefore, it was necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now, if we were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, since there are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law. Uh, these serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle, for God said, Be careful that you make everything in according to the patterns that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry, and to that degree, he's the mediator of a better covenant, uh, which has been established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, he says, See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with the ancestors, and on that day, I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. For this is the covenant that I made, that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, this is the good part. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each, and each his brother or sister saying, Know the Lord, because they will know me. From the least to the greatest of them, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember, remember their sins. For some of you, this is resonating. By saying a new covenant, he has declared that the first is obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. Let us pray. Lord, we, we are thankful that um, we don't have to strive anymore. We are thankful that you've done the good work, Lord. We are thankful that you are not an absent God. Um, you're a God that's there in the midst of all that is going on in our lives, Lord. And we can rest in you, Lord. We are thankful, Lord, that in your work we see something that is perfect, something that is holy, something that is superior, something that can never be repeated something that we can stake our lives on, Lord. And so, Lord, as I stand here, Lord, I'm not standing on my own two feet, Lord, but you put me here, and so speak through me, Lord. Uh, speak through me the words of life, the words that have meaning. Um, speak through me, Lord, uh, in a way that will resonate with everyone here, regardless of where they are right now, Lord. Lord, we love you. We need you. It's clear in the scriptures as we go through the life of Israel, Lord, that we are no different. And so, Lord, that very same grace, the very same attention that you gave to Israel, I pray that it's felt in here, Lord. And so, Lord, uh, we give this morning to you as we have been doing since the beginning. 
um, pray that um, we may have uh, may have ears to hear, Lord, and eyes to see. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, in the part one, as I said, um, Jesus Christ, the superior uh, priest. Uh, now, in verse one, right at the beginning, the writer of Hebrews says, now the main point of what is being said is this. And so what we see right off the gate is that the writer of, of Hebrews has been making a point, right? He's been making a very, very big point. This is almost the culmination of this point. And with this point, he's, he's, he's taken a lot of time, almost seven chapters, to make this point. So this point is an earth-shattering point. This is a life-changing point. And so we have to know what is it that the writer of Hebrews has been saying. Now, for many of us who are here, maybe um, for the guys that I knew, we always say this. And as, as boring as it may sound, it's, it's important because, man, we forget. But uh, when we look at the scriptures, the way that they are, the scriptures were not in their original form. They didn't have chapters. They didn't have headings. They didn't have verse numbers. These were, these were letters. And so often we look at a chapter, look at chapter 7 and say, man, I'm just going to deal with chapter 7. I'm going to find everything that I need in chapter 7. And in this case, we actually have to go back through chapters one to chapter six and seven to seven rather, just to see what are the points that have been, that he's been making. And so, yeah, so we are going to read chapters one to seven. So I want our team, please lock the doors. <laughs> so what we can see if we go back to the different chapters, right? Uh, chapters one to two, uh, what the writer of Hebrews has been saying is that Jesus Christ is superior to the angels. So that might not resonate as much for us, but uh, when you look at ancient Jew Jewish culture, when they looked at angels, they looked at they looked at looked at them very differently, like like we do. So for us, culture, popular culture, angels, little baby uh, with little wings, but angels had a presence. But more than that, angels actually had a massive role in the giving of the law. Yeah. And so at Mount, Mount Sinai, the belief was that angels actually gave the Torah to Moses, right? And so what, what the writer of Hebrews then goes to say, say in, um, in chapters 1 to 2 is that, no, um, if, you, if that's what you believe about the angels, Jesus Christ is the, is the son that God has sent and he speaks through him in the last days. And so his word is more superior. And therefore, Jesus Christ is superior to the angels. And then as we look at chapters uh, 3 to 4, uh, it's that Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. right? And Jesus Christ being superior to Moses, we see Moses as this patriarchal character. This is the guy that basically set up the tabernacle system. And so in Jesus Christ, the writer of Hebrews argues that the Moses that you look at, we, I get, we get it. He set up the tabernacle system, the ritual system, the sacrificial system. Uh, but in Jesus Christ, we have one whose sacrificial system is in heaven. And therefore, his, um, his system is elevated. Yeah. And then as we look to chapters 5 and 6, uh, we see that Jesus Christ is superior uh, to the Levitical priesthood. And so if you're not aware of what this means, it's, that it's basically that within the tribes, there was a specific tribe that would actually, that would be serving the people as priests. And this was the uh, tribe of Levi. So you couldn't be a priest if you are not from the tribe of Levi. And so what the writer of Hebrews does is that Jesus Christ isn't even from the tribe of Levi. We'll actually talk about this uh, a little bit later on. But Jesus Christ is actually in the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, passed on and preached on this uh, two Sundays ago, he's this mysterious character, right? Um, if we're to almost say we, we put uh, importance based on how long he's there, he would not be very important because as soon as he's appeared, he disappears. But man, there's something magnificent about when he appears, what he does, what happens, and when he disappears. 
one, the patriarch Abraham, he honors him as if he's a priest, right? And on top of that, this Melchizedek, Melchizedek character, he has this thing of he's a king priest. There's arguments about whether or not it's Jesus, uh, whether or not it's, it's someone else. But the whole point that the writer of Hebrews said that Jesus Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. In essence, no one before, no one after. This is the king priest that we're looking at. And so when the writer of Hebrews has been saying basically is that Jesus Christ is superior. He's giving us the CV of Jesus Christ and he's building up to this main point that Jesus Christ is superior to anything and everything that has come before. And therefore, there cannot be any doubt about who he says he is and what he says he can do. And so now in the back of our minds, the main point is this. Uh, this is the kind of high priest that we have, one who's superior to angels, one who's superior to Moses, and one who's superior to the Levitical priesthood. And so as we look at, look at the rest of verses 1 to 2, uh, it tells that the high priest sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Yeah. He's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not by man. And so the image painted here, it's a very, very powerful image. Uh, sitting at the right hand of, of majesty denotes power. It denotes authority, acceptance, and honor. Uh, it denotes that Christ has not, been, has not only been elevated to the place of highest honor, but he also shares in God's authority. Yeah. Right? And so this, this sitting at the right hand of majesty, uh, it's a motif that actually that occurs through a lot of the, of the New Testament. Uh, this is actually, um, we see this in the Psalm 110, Psalm 110 verses 1 to 2. It's a Psalm of David. It's, it's a widely quoted Psalm um, in, uh, in the New Testament. And so it's not going to come up here, but what David essentially says is that um, the Lord said to my Lord, uh, sit, sit there, sit at my right hand, and I will make your enemies my your footstool. And he basically says, your scepter goes out, you conquer, and you defeat your enemies. And, and this this scripture has been used a lot of times to denote royalty, monarchy. That Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. He's the long-awaited King that they've been waiting for, which made sense as well because Jesus Christ was in the tribe of Judah. But as much as it's widely used to denote Jesus Christ as the King of Kings. Uh, when we look at Zechariah 13, uh, it reads as follows, 613, pardon me, 613. It reads as follows. Yes, he will build the Lord's temple. He will bear royal splendor and will sit on his throne and rule. There will be a priest in his, in his throne, on his throne, and there will be a peaceful council between the two of them. And so... The context of this story is that this is, this is um, ancient Israel. They've been conquered. They, they are in exile once again. And so they're going back and they're trying to re re resurrect the temple system, right? And so they have these two characters, right? They have Joshua, um, not Joshua uh, from before. This is Joshua, uh, son of uh, Nehemiah, and uh, Zerubbabel. And so both of them go back, and one almost uh, fulfills the role of the priest, the other one fulfills the role of the king, right? I think it's in, I think this is the only one time where both of them could actually serve um, the kingdom uh, side by side as king and priest. But this is just a shadow, this is just a type. So what's actually happening in Zechariah 6.13, it's actually pointing to the real king priest, and that is Jesus Christ, who will fulfill this role on the throne, this dual role. And so what's being demonstrated here is, once again, this is a superior priest, right? This is a superior priest in every way possible. He's even a king. And so... The writer here also demonstrates that unlike the priests of the Levitical order, whose work was never complete in the temple, were constantly on their feet, uh, constantly entering the sanctuary with fear and trepidation. Uh, Jesus sits because his work is done. Uh, he has been found acceptable, and the Father is happy. Amen.
And so when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, it really is finished. We don't have to redo this whole process. And so the curtain uh, tears in half in the sanctuary, uh, signifying that the old temple system is done. Anyone can go into the Holy of Holies now through Jesus Christ. Amen to that. So there's a new sanctuary. There's a new tabernacle that has been set up. And this has been set up by God in heaven. And Jesus oversees this. Can never be destroyed or be outdated. And Jesus Christ is a minister in there. And what I love about this is that when he speaks about Jesus as a minister in this tabernacle, in this sanctuary, is that Jesus Christ is a ministry. His ministry is all-encompassing. You know, when you think about the priest in the old days, their ministry was limited. It was very ritualistic. Um, basically, if the, mini- if the priest is not there, your issues couldn't be addressed. But in Jesus Christ, we have one who intercedes for us, yeah. one who's there in our time of need. You don't have to go to the temple. You can just get down on your knees and pray to him wherever you are. Yeah. Right? And so what he's reiterating here is reminding us that what I'm presenting is not a repackaging. This is something new. This is something unseen. This is not an upgrade or an update. This is incomprehensibly new and superior. And I imagine if if this was playground economics, right? Uh, You know, um, this is my, my dad's car can fly. You know, your dad's car can't fly. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews will be saying, so your high priest is from a long line of the Levitical order. And his response will be, well, mine has no one before or after him, right? And my high priest is sitting, right? Uh, in heaven, just by the way, at the right hand of majesty. Where's your high priest sitting? Oh, in a grave, sorry, you know? My high priest is a minister in the tabernacle set up by God. Uh, Who set up your tabernacle? How many times has this been destroyed? Right? How many times are you guys going to rebuild it? Right? His tabernacle never gets destroyed. So as we shift on to the next verse, verses 3 to 5, it continues to press into the distinctiveness of the heavenly ministry of Jesus Christ by contrasting, contrasting against the old, uh, old covenant. As so the verses three to four, uh, three, four, five reads as follows. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest since there are those offering this, the gifts prescribed by the law. Excuse me. <clears throat> They serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Um, They serve as a copy of the heavenly things as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. So in verse 3, the old covenant priests would offer animal sacrifices, which is something that they would do over and over and over again. Uh, showing that this was very, it's, it was a very inadequate process. It's something that you had to repeat over and over again. While in Jesus Christ, he offered a gift unlike any other gift that had ever been seen. And it's, it's not a gift that will ever be offered again. He offered himself, perfect and holy, the eternal son of God. So only an eternal sacrifice could, satis- could satisfy eternal offenses. And this was the impact of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And we look at verse 4, uh, already said this, Jesus couldn't exercise his priesthood on earth because he was disqualified. He was not from the Levitical order. He was from Judah. And so therefore, his priestlyhood is not on earth. It's in heaven. And that, is, and that for us is a comfort. It's a superior priesthood. So when you look at verse 5, the priesthood on earth served as a shadow of the priesthood in heaven. The old covenant sacrificial system, the rituals, they were, they were all just shadows of something better to come. And man, 
you know, when we look at, you know, the, the we will go through this just a little bit later. When we go through the whole, whole sacrificial system and how it's a shadow, it's crazy to stake your life on a shadow. It's crazy to stake on your life that will be passing, something that has no permanence. And so as we summarize this, the annual rituals are nothing compared to Jesus. Um, sorry, the annual, the annual rituals are nothing compared to Jesus Christ's high priestly offering of himself once and for all on the cross and now serving in heaven on our behalf. There is nothing that compares to Jesus' position at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. His heavenly ministry is much more excellent than any earthly ministry ever was and anything that would come after that. And so here's the thing that I need, that I need for us to understand um, in terms of this letter that has been written. <clears throat> The writer of Hebrews isn't writing this for the sake of arguing. Uh, this isn't about being right or proving that someone is wrong. This isn't about winning an argument. There's something greater here. This isn't social media discourse, right? This isn't, let me stick it to them and show them how stupid or how incorrect they are. Man, I, I got to repent of that. You know, I get caught up. And I'm like, oh, this person, you know, they don't know their doctrine. Let, the, let me set them straight, right? How many people have come to Christ through an argument on social media? I'm willing to stake my life on that zero. No one has read and said, man, you, you stuck it to me. Like, man, when, when you explained the Trinity the way that you did, I've been doubting, but the way you put it out there, man, like now I'm converted, right? And so this isn't what the writer of Hebrews is doing. What he is doing is encouraging them to stay focused on Jesus, who is the reality and fulfillment of all the old, uh, of all the old system pointing towards. Because here's the thing that we need to first understand is that the first readers of this letter, the audience, because remember, this wasn't written to us. Yeah. It's a different audience, right? The first, reader of, the first readers of this letter were basically being persecuted, Right? They were being persecuted. They had chosen Christ. And so now it started to feel like this thing isn't working as much as it could. You know, the allegiance to Jesus Christ was putting them in hotter water than uh, they expected. And so a lot of them were starting to turn back. Say, man, this is too difficult, right? This isn't necessary. The, let, let me maybe, let me revert back to what I know. What is safe, what is comfortable, you know, to what I'm familiar with. And for them, this would have been the, the, religi the religious practices embedded in the Ju Judaic culture. And what the writer is saying is, there is more. There is something better for your life in this age and the next age. And so what you're currently holding on to, it may be what you, it may be what you know, it may be what is comfortable, it may be what is familiar. But on the day of reckoning, it will not uphold you. It will not last. And so for us this morning, <clears throat> we don't have ancient Judaic cultures to go back to. We don't have ancient rituals to fall back on when this gets tough. Uh, it's actually quite easy to just sit back and say, man, this, is, this isn't applicable to me. All right? Uh, this is just a study on Israel. Um, I'm just going to sit here. A uh, number of facts that I can put in my pocket to unpack um, later on, you know. Maybe even be laughing at the foolishness of, of these people. Like, man, you started, with, uh, you started with Christ and now you want to go back to the old system. But we have old covenants, right? There are things that we want to fall back on when the going gets tough, right? There are things that, you know... They are a safe space for us. The things that, um, you know, when Jesus is not working out, maybe I'll go to that. This, for me, this is a situational Christianity, right? Everyone is a Christian until it's impractical to be one, right? Everyone is a Christian until it's impractical, impractical to be one, right? When the world starts to fall apart, then it's like, man, this Christianity thing is not worth it. 
let me go to what I have, what I think I have control over. Usually those things have control over me. And so maybe, as I said, we don't have ancient Jewish cultures to go back to, but we have, we have some old covenant uh, beliefs. We have some old things that we have in our lives, things that we go back to. I don't even go as far as to say things don't have to get tough, to be quite honest. Like when I look at South Africa as a country, by and large, uh, there are very few of us here that can actually say we're being persecuted. If we're being persecuted, it's probably because maybe we're not nice people, right? And then we, and then we come here and say, please, please pray for me. I'm being persecuted at work. It's like, no, you're not, you're not submitting your reports on time. <laughs> like, like it's, it's now been like three months. Like your boss is not happy. Your boss is not persecuting you. So, so by and large, most of us, we're not, we're, not, we're not going through that. And so, yeah, what, what are the spaces that we're going back to? What are the things that are we still holding on to where it's Christ plus this? So we have to learn to be able to spot all covenant beliefs. And I believe a lot of the time it's things that we think, like I said, it's things that we, we think we have control over. And it's things that make us feel safe. It's things that make us feel comfortable. And these are all things that we have to give to Jesus Christ because he's in control. He's our safety. He's our place of comfort. And so as we move along, <clears throat> verse 6 then takes us to the end of uh, part 1 and the beginning of part 2. And it reads as follows. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry. <clears throat> and to that degree is the mediator of a better covenant, which, was, which, is, which has been established on better promises. Superior ministry, we've spoken about that. A better covenant, we're about to speak about that. Better promises, right? So when you look at the whole thing of promises, in the Old Testament, there were actually a number of promises, right? So if there's one thing that God does, it doesn't shortchange his people. So there were numerous, there were numerous promises, you know, some of them um, related to his relationship with them. Um, it's not going to go up, but Exodus 9, 19 verses 5 to 6 is basically spoke about, if you, basically, if you obey me, I'll be your God and you'll be my people and you will become a kingdom of priests, right? And then we have all these other ones that were very good, very, very good promises but a lot of them were very centered on the now. So um, in your spare time, you can I know how much you guys love Deuteronomy, Leviticus, <laughs> Numbers. It's just like, why don't we preach out of those books more often? So you've got homework. You guys can read through uh, Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. But it basically gives us a number of promises, right? And so a lot of these promises were promises of the length of days. You will live longer. Um, it was about the increase in numbers. Your, your family will multiply to become bigger. Um, seed time, harvest, you will get rain at this appointed time. Um, national privileges, uh, extraordinary peace. You guys will go through a period of peace where there's no war, abundance and prosperity. And this were all great things. And, and here's the thing. <laughs> These are, not, these are not bad in, the, in and by themselves, right? They are good things, but they're good things that don't satisfy, right? They're good things that don't address fulfillment. They're good things that don't address the need for a savior, right? So what we see is that the people of God often will enjoy some of these promises over time, uh, but then over time, something happens, um, you know, these seasons of peace, prosperity, and abundance, they kind of forget about God. And then we read, everyone did uh, what was good in their own sight. And God just says, hey, I'm going to leave you to what you guys want, which usually unravels, which really um, causes things to just fall mm -hmm. apart for that, for that nation. And then they cry out to God. And once again, God intervenes. Then there's another, seasons of there's another season of abundance. There's another season of prosperity. And guess what? The next chapter, right? Same thing. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And this is a pattern, right? It just goes around and around and around. It's that basically 
no matter what things we have, they're not addressing the need for a savior. Our hearts will remain unchanged. And you know what? I'll be honest. Israel gets a very bad rep um, for everything they've, they've done. I mean, it's kind of like in the Bible and it's right there. You know, I, I've never understood, uh, you know, people that critique uh, Christians or Christianity. And so you guys, you think you're perfect. You guys think, you know, you're holy and everything. Well, for one, we are perfect and holy through Jesus Christ. You know, but when you when you read the when you read much of the Bible, whatever role we have in the Bible, man, we have messed it up royally, yeah. right? And so I will tell you now that um, if we were to separate, I'm sorry, not separate, replace Israel with any other nation, let's pick the Twanas. The it, it would it would be exactly the same, right? Um, I, I think maybe we had we had better luck if we maybe the chosen nation would defend the people. So moving along. <laughs> so as I was saying, they, they get a they get a bad rep, but we are not different from them, right? And so we, we kind of see this in our lives. We have these seasons, our, these seasons in our lives as well, exactly like Israel, right? Go through good times, and then when things fall apart, then we you know we see you there. By the door, I'm back. It's like, oh wow, it's been it's been five months, or five years, ten years, whatever. You know, I've come back to church. I've come back to find God, which which absolutely isn't wrong, right? Yeah. Don't 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 hear. No, I should not come to church. Just identifying patterns with our forefathers, right? Because one thing that I in in the time that I've been a Christian, right, I've never heard someone saying. Man, I haven't been at church for like five months or five years. I just, man, this has been so much prosperity and abundance in my life. I just thought I'd come back and thank God. It's usually the opposite, right? And so we are no different from Israel. And so in a way, while Israel did not cover themselves in glory, uh, the old covenant, although not bad, the old covenant was it was good in what it was meant for, right? And there's, there's, this, there's this tension of that, you know, um, and there's words used, you know, the old covenant was, was not faultless, right? And so the first thing that we do is that, did God give them or send them something that was faulty? No, it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was that this was a shadow, right? It was meant to do specific things, but there are other things that it was not qualified to do. But in the same breath, we have a role to play in the old covenant that we also could not meet the requirements of the old covenant, right? And so when we look at this, we understand that the old covenant was just a shadow of something better to come and therefore lacking, which then necess necessitated the coming of a new covenant, uh, which is what we'll be talking about Next, so part two, a better covenant. So this is, verse seven reads as follows. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for the second. But finding fault with his people, he says, and I'll stop right there. And so this, this finding fault, this is reiterated in the last part of verse nine, where in speaking about the Israelites, God basically says, hey, I showed no concern for them says the Lord, because they did not uh, continue in my covenant. And, th and these are the Israelites, guys. These are the guys that saw miracle after miracle after miracle, right? And they st still did not meet the requirements of the covenant. They still distrusted God. And so for one thing, if, if you're sitting here and you feel like, man, God, if you do this, then I will do this. I'm telling you, it's a very bad start, right? God could appear, who could, he could appear in a cloud, he did at a point in time, and that would do nothing for our hearts. God could give you every job, everything that you ever needed now. It does not address the heart, right? And so this is where Israel finds themselves. And so we see this often, you know? God gives us something that is good, right? But through our own makings, we turn that something into something bad, right? Perfect, perfect example, the marriage covenant. This is something that is amazing. This is something that is beautiful. And you've managed to, but we've managed to make a mess out of it, right? When we look at the divorce rates, right? 
through the ceiling. And uh, man, it's uh, it's a shame because uh, within the Christian community, the divorce rates aren't any better, right? It's very sad. And even as I say this, because I know people that are struggling, it's it's very sad, right? And marriages don't look any better than people in the world, right? That, that, that doesn't make sense. And so we often say this, that you know what? The covenant of marriage is under attack. Yeah. And it is very true, right? There are, there are principalities, there are dark powers that want to sink this. And while that is very true, but what I do believe is that, man, we are our own enemies. We cannibalize our own marriages, Right? And where, and what we look at marriage is that God intends for marriage, the marriage covenant, to be a safe space for love, grace, vulnerability, servitude towards one another, and so many more things. But more than that, it's a reflection of a better reality of Jesus Christ and the church. And somehow, this marriage covenant, this beautiful thing that God has gifted to us, this lovely institution, it gets a bad rep. We're not realizing that we're the problem. You just have to go into social media and look at what people are saying about marriage. You know, you know marriage is a trap. You know, it's better to remain single. You know, while there's some that are called to, to singlehood, one thing I can say is that marriage is not a trap, right? Marriage is a very beautiful place. But what we misunderstand is that, man, we are the issue. And as much as we look at Israel and the old covenant, they, they, they were the issue. We have perfect examples uh, in this day and age. And you may be wondering, man, Kenny, why the constant back and forth with Israel and us? Uh, for one, it's, it's easy to read and uh, listen to this as a study on Israel and remove ourselves from this, you know, and not realize that this is a study on humanity. This is a study on us. The truth is, thousands of years later, whatever innovations we have, whatever privileges we have, we aren't too different. So I'll keep dancing between the two because, man, this, this could have just been any modern nation here. All right. So just one more thing, man. I, I know I spoke about marriage, I spoke about divorce, and I know we've got people that have that have gone through that process, people that are thinking about that process. Um, I just want to let you know, man, this, uh, when you're going through this, whatever is happening, doesn't speak to your value in life, doesn't speak to who you are, right? It doesn't determine who you are before God, <laughs> right? You're just still as important. Uh, you're still made in the image of God. And so when you walk in here, don't walk in with the guilt of that, man, I've done this thing. Right, because all are welcome. And so, man, come speak to us. If you feel like, man, um, my marriage is teetering, my marriage is going through the most, um, I'm not sure if it will survive tomorrow, next week, or next month, come speak to us, man. And, oh, man, we don't promise to fix it because we cannot. You know, we, we can't promise to heal you because we cannot. But in our endeavors, we promise to point to the one that can do this. We promise to point to the one that heals, that can fix your marriage. And so once again, even though I've given this example of marriage, this, is, this isn't a slight at you, man. This is just an identification of what's happening in society. So please, if you're going through that, come speak to us, come speak to the elder wives as well. Um, and man, if, if your marriage is fantastic, come speak to us as well. We wanna hear those stories. For real, we wanna hear those stories. We wanna hear, man, um, <coughs> We've been going through a very good season of marriage. We've been doing this. These are some of the things that we're doing just to uphold uh, and anchor ourselves in Christ to make sure this is a reflection of something better. I want to hear those stories as well, you know. So as we continue. In the rest of the text, um, verses 8 to 12, uh, this, is, this is actually a quotation from uh, Jeremiah um, of the coming new covenant. Very, very beautiful words. And what I love about this is the fact that as we are reading through this, um, and this is from Jeremiah, Ezekiel was also tracking with this. Uh, there's this beautiful thing of that, man, 
God has always been making a plan. God has always been making a plan. His people are in exile, but God has not forgotten about them. And so verses 8 to 9 reads as follows. Um, See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with the ancestors on the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of, out of the land of Egypt. And what we have here is that God isn't absent, God is not uninvolved, and God is not indifferent. Yeah. Right? Amen. The consistent theme is that God sees and God acts. God sees and God acts. And in every turn of the story, God is always making a plan for his people. God is always making a means to make sure that his people are reconnected with him. God cares for his people. And sometimes there's a, there's a wrestle with God's timing, right? If you're all honest, right? There's a wrestle with his methods as well. And, you know, sometimes we may think, you know, God is, God is taking too long or you could have done things this way, Right? One of the first things is, man, why did it take so long for the new covenant to come? Why did it take so long for Jesus Christ to come? You know? And I genuinely do not have any deep philosophical answers on this. And what I'm about to say may sound like a cop-out, right? But it is an answer nonetheless. But um, so I am not God, right? So I, I mean, it's quite obvious. Um, it's, yeah, even to my daughter, it's quite obvious, Right? But I'm not God, right? I, I cannot predict what's going to happen, not, not even the next minute, the next second, right? And God is God. God sees into eternity, right? God has plans, right, that I could not fathom, right? If I was to tell you story and story and story about how something happened and this was like years in the making and just... If you'd taken me back a few years and if you'd said, man, do you, do you know that this will happen in three years' time? I would not believe you. But man, the fact that we are talking to God who sees into eternity, that's enough to say, man, we can trust him, right? And so, yeah. You know, God could have teleported Israel to the promised land, could have skipped um, the wilderness, you know, Jesus Christ could have come uh, right after that. And the truth of the matter is that things would have remained exactly the same. Israel still would have rebelled. Israel still would have been Israel. And that is because these things don't deal with the heart. So I love what uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Joby said last week, uh, basically saying that, um, you know, he's never experienced God to be late or to be too early. So what we see is that God's timing and God's, God's methods are never the issue. The issue is our trust in him. And to be quite honest, I'm well aware that, man, we are all going through something. There's something that um, is keeping us late, uh, keeping us uh, up late, late at night. It's things that when you step through, uh, through the doors, there's a tension like, I'm here again. I'm hoping God will change my situation. I'm hoping God will do something. You know, and it may feel like, man, God, I need to change this, but you're being silent or you're not doing what you need to do. And what I'm asking for isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. And so for that, I, I, I mean, I felt that pain. I felt that anxiety. I think if we're all just to stand up here and share our stories, we have a story in the past currently or currently that just says, man, we're waiting on this and this will change our lives. But God, it feels like, God, you're not answering or oh God, you're silent. And so my encouragement and my reminder to you, if you've already crossed the line of faith, if you've already made that decision to follow Christ, or even if you haven't made that commitment, is this. God may feel silent in this specific time for you, but where he's definitely not silent is at the fulfillment of the new covenant through his son, Jesus Christ. This, the cross is not silent. What Jesus Christ did on the cross is not silent. In Matthew 26, 28, uh, Jesus basically says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out 
for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Right? And so this is at the Last Supper. Um, Paul double clicks on this in, in Corinthians where he's encouraging us to remember this. And so next week, we'll be having communion. We'll be remembering this. Right? So let's posture our hearts for next week. And man, if you feel like, man, I still have questions, you know, speak to someone after the service. Speak to someone and say, hey, I have questions. I'm not sure if I've crossed the line of faith. I'm not sure if God even hears me. Speak to someone because we want you in communion next week. And so as we go through that, we remember that God is loved very loudly, right? And so... When you look at this message of the cross, how loud it was throughout the ages, rulers and nation groups, they've, tar- they've tried to bury the Bible, right? They've tried to bury the story of Jesus Christ. They've tried to burn it. They've tried to ban it. Um, they've tried everything. People have tried to rewrite it, yet it still overcomes. People have tried to write their own lifestyles into it. It still overcomes. The essential truth of who Jesus Christ is and why Jesus Christ is the chief for his people continues to prevail. And in the new covenant, God is loudly declaring that I have seen, I have acted once and for all in this life and the next. Meaning that if we may have doubts over specific things, the specific things, like I said, that are keeping us up at night, if there's a tension in our hearts that Is this going to be different tomorrow? I don't have an answer for that. But one thing is for sure is that God hasn't left you, has not left anything open. There's no interpretation on his love, right? God loves his people. God cares. Very famous uh, scriptures, John 3, 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Paul tracks with this in Romans 5, 8. He says, but God proves his own love for us in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. So my encouragement is that the specific things going in your, in your life right now, however big, however small, they're important. I will not dismiss the importance in your life. Submit them to the fact that God God knows, God cares, and we have evidence of that at the cross of Jesus Christ. So as we move on, we read further, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those years, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. These words are refreshing. Uh, This is just God upping the ante of his commitment to his people that I do care. So because the new covenant isn't just about the forgiveness forgiveness of sins, the other aspect of it is that God creates a new people. So when we read in uh, Deuteronomy 11 verses 18 to 21 regarding God's word, it's a very famous, a very famous scripture, but basically it says, you know, memorize these laws, think about them, write them down, write down copies and tie them to your wrists and your foreheads to help you obey them. Teach them to your children, talk about them all the time, whether you're at home or working along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning. Write them on the door frames of your homes and on your town gates. And the contrast here is staggering. When we read this, we see <clears throat> the emphasis is on Israel right? Um, We can see that the characteristic of the old covenant is basically do, 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 and strive some more until you reach perfection, right? And when we look at the new covenant, the verbs belong to God. God is the one that's doing, right? And this is great news. This is the greatest news ever because three things, man. One, God does the work. I don't have to do the work, right? God is the adult in the room, right? So I'm I'm turning 40 next year. Um, It's been very weird in that, you know, you go through this life phase of, um, you don't know when you quite, when you become the adult in the room. 
right? So when something happens, whether it's tragedy at home or, you know, it's an emergency, often what you used to is you look for the adult in the room. This is the person that will fix everything. This is the, you know, will basically put everything on them and they will do it and they will do that. You know, for some of us, we've been, we've been doing this for years and that's unfortunate. <coughs> but <clears throat> you get to a point where you become the adult in the room, right? And you think to yourself, man, I, I don't have it all together, right? And while everyone's looking to you, you're also looking for the adult in the room. What I'm saying is that, thank God we don't have to stand up in the room and we don't have to look to Pastor Jonah, right? We don't have to look to Tiam, we don't have to look to anyone else here as the adults in the room. We can look to God. God is the adult in the room. God takes care of business, right? And the second one is that this means that God is calling us from striving to rest, from self-reliance to dependence. And the last one is God is calling us to newness, right? As I said, Ezekiel was tracking with this. Um, almost also a very, very famous scripture. This is Ezekiel 36, 27, 26 to 27. And he says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And God is basically saying is that let me come in and do the work. Allow me to do the work. I'm the adult in the room. You've done as much as you can with as much as you have. And he's saying that, man, how has it worked out? And for a number of us here, God is saying that to us. And for a number of us, maybe God has been saying this for, for quite a while, that, man, how, for how much longer can you strive? Are you not tired of striving? Right? How much longer can you go on your own strength? You know, with, with the old, you know, when you look at the old covenants in our lives, it's usually they're really dressed nice. They're dressed in productivity. You know, they're dressed in, um, you know, this, these are the good things that, you know, everyone gets in life. This is if I just get this job, then dot, dot, dot. If I just get this promotion, then dot, dot, dot. You know, if I become this person, then dot, dot, dot. And so we always think, man, if I can continue striving for this, striving for this and giving my all to this. Freedom awaits us on the other side. And what is the truth? It starts all over again. It's the next position. It's the next qualification. It's the next relationship. It's the next dot, dot, dot. And true freedom is found in that God has done it all. True freedom is found in that God has achieved everything that we need. <clears throat> and at the end of verses 10 and verses 12, we see one of the main outcomes of this better covenant, and it's this. We have a right standing with God, and we are united with God. We enter into a relationship with him with the freedom of a clear conscience for all eternity. What I love about it is it starts now, right? It starts now. This isn't something that's a future event. This is something that starts now. This is something that the old covenant could never do. Generation after generation after generation would just stray away from God. As we look at the end of verse 10, which reads as follows, I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. That's good news, guys. Yeah. Amen. That is good news, man. Ah oh, man, this is good news. Like the, the the idea of many of us would have been in a position like this at a point in time where man, I've done something wrong and I I don't know I know that what I need to receive from that person is wrath. Yeah. And we don't know what the outcome will be. The guilt, the tension within us of having to wait and be at the mercy of someone else. It's not a nice feeling and the great feeling of knowing that person has forgiven me. Man, there's nothing greater than that. But here's the thing as humans, there's this lingering thought because you, this person says, I've forgiven you. Then you see them the next day and they're kind of cold towards you. 
and you start to wonder, have they really forgiven me? And that thing continues to linger, that maybe things will never be the same, right? This um, beautiful Psalm, King David, Psalm 32 reads as follow, as follows, how joyful is the one whose right, whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and whose spirit is no deceit. There's no greater human status than to know that God has forgiven, God has forgiven us. And because of that, we have fullness of life and that God God does not say, man, remember what you did, even if it's the thousandth, th thousandth time that you're doing it. God does not come back and hold it against us. And in this, we find fullness. When Jesus comes, appears on the scene, um, he, says, he says, the thief comes to still kill and destroy. Uh, this is John 10.10. 10. But I've come so that they may have life and have it to the full. This fullness redirects our passions. It redirects our fulfillments. It redirects our endeavors. And so instead of looking to qualifications, instead of looking to relationships, to work, instead of looking to achievements, to attain fulfillment, which is fleeting, we submit this thing to God, right? We submit them to God because we can better enjoy them under his care. Because what tends to happen is that without direction, these things start to rule over us. We start to chase them and we chase them until the end and our lives in ruin and we realize that, man, I'm right at the top, but why am I not happy, right? So we're getting to, getting to the end. So... Verse 13, um, and each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each his brother or, or, or sister. Sorry, it's verse 12, I think, verse 11. Um, each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each his brother or sister, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of, to the greatest of them. And so uh, if you're reading through this very quickly, the first thing that you might think is that there's no need for teachers right, um, which is absolutely incorrect uh, because when you look at the whole of Scripture, um, Paul, skips, uh, Paul speaks about the, the gift of teaching explicitly as one of the gifts that God gives uh, to his people. Um, but what is being said here, is, it's very simple, is that everyone in the covenant will know God for themselves, regardless of their social standing. So... Whoever you are, wherever you're coming from, whatever you've been through, right, you can know God, right? There's no need for a mediator. All are welcome, right? So you don't have to first go fix yourself to appear perfect here. No, you come here as you are, right? This, this becomes a lovely transcultural community where we get to know that you know, not only are we all coming from different backgrounds, but we've all got different experiences. Uh, we've got people that just came to Christ yesterday. We've got people that have been on this for 20 years, right? And But we're all saying, man, we can all know God and be known by him, right? And so this means, man, for, for Rooted Fellowship Church, you know, um, the eldership, we don't have a monopoly over knowing God, Right? Man, even Rooted Fellowship does not have a monopoly over knowing God, right? So, yeah, so we can all have a personal relationship with God. But also I have to say this, that in the same breath, your relationship with God cannot depend on what happens here on Sunday, yeah. right? Yeah. It cannot depend on just these two hours. Pastor Ane has said it, man, if this is the only place where you're feeding, that is not healthy. You are malnourished, right? And that's the lovely thing about the new covenant is that you don't have to go to a temple. You don't have to go to a priest. As soon as you step out this door in your car, you can talk to God, right? And so as we come to the end of our text for this morning and the end of the message, the writer concludes by declaring that the old covenant is, is obsolete. And 
This is verse 13. It says, by saying a new covenant, he's declared that the first is obsolete and what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. And this has been the case throughout all generations, right? Many alternative beliefs have come and have come and gone. Many dress themselves up as New Age beliefs, but they couldn't stand the test of time. There have been many religions that have come through the ages, and yet as quickly as they come, they've disappeared. And they just come back dressed as something different, but the theme is the same. They will not last. And the ones that have lasted, the ones that have basically been there since the beginning, aside Christianity, they're still unable to deal, uh, unable to deal with man's inability to please God, right? And where they've tried to get rid of God, they are unable to deal with, they are able to deal with man's inability to find meaning and fulfillment, right? And so with Jesus Christ. Basically, Christianity has stood the test of time solely on that the central truths of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, are anchored in the heavenly priest of Christ and a new covenant that's been forged in heaven. Amen. Church, this is worth putting your faith in. Let's pray. Lord, once again, thank you that if anything, you are not silent. If anything, you are not absent. If anything, you are not indifferent. What we see at the cross as a completion of the new covenant, what we see, Lord, is you reenacting a new way that we can relate to you once and for all. That, Lord, the Holy of Holies is, is open. That, Lord, we can call you Abba Father. That, Lord, we don't have to fix ourselves first before we come to you that is foolishness lord because we will, we will never arrive at the destination but that god you have gone ahead you have prepared the way you have done a good work and we can we can put our lives on that lord and so lord thank you that the new covenant is not just a declaration of who you are it's an invitation as well it's an invitation for those that don't know you, for those that are still doubting. For those that are saying, man, can I, can I trust this? And the answer is yes, you can trust this. Because this was not made by man, this was made by God. And so with that, Lord, for us that have been walking this road for quite a while, Lord, reveal to us this old covenant habits that we have in our hearts. Reveal to us the things that we are holding on to in our pockets in case this Christianity thing doesn't work out. Convict our hearts, Lord, of where we're dipping into in life where we're not supposed to be. Bring us back to you, the true fountain of life, the true bread, the true light of the world. Recenter us in you, Lord. Rekindle that old flame. And so, Lord, with this, be with us. I pray that you convict us of situational Christianity. That where, Lord, we, we are Christians until it's impractical to be so, Lord, convict us of that. Call us out of that, Lord. Because it's robbing us of joy. That's the truth. It's robbing us of complete joy. There's nothing in this world, Lord, that can substitute being with you, Lord. And while the truth of the matter is, as we go out into the world, it's a battle. You won the battle, Lord. We can stake our lives in that. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you because you've loved us first, Lord. And so it's in your holy name we pray. Amen.